Welcome to part one DC biasing of the designing an optimized voltage divider biased BJT common emitter amplifier. The invention of the transistor marked the beginning of a technological revolution that continues today. The bipolar junction transistor is typically used in one of two ways, either as a linear amplifier to boost or amplify an electrical signal or as an electronic switch. This lesson is going to focus on the application of a bipolar junction transistor as an amplifier. So you've, if you haven't already, I highly recommend that you go and read up on transistors, any textbook, or even look up some information online. The book that I use, I've got listed here. It's the Floyd Electronic Devices Conventional Current Version. So here are some common electronic laws that are, we're going to use to help us calculate this DC bias circuit. Now hopefully everybody is really familiar with Ohm's Law and how to work it back and forth. Um, but the gist of Ohm's Law or the basics of Ohm's Law is voltage is equal to current times resistance. Kirchhoff's voltage and current laws are also very important and we're going to use this heavily to um, calculate this circuit. Uh, but Kirchhoff's voltage law states that for a closed loop or series path, the algebraic sum of all the voltage around that closed loop should equal zero. Kirchhoff's current law states that the algebraic sum of all the currents flowing into and out of a node should also equal zero. BJT transistors are current controlled devices. The DC current gain of a transistor is the ratio of the DC collector current to the DC base current and is designated as beta. So beta is equal to the collector current divided by the base current. Beta is also a manufacturer specification and is listed as a range. The term HFE may be used interchangeably uh, with beta on the data sheet. So those two terms are interchangeable. A curve tracer is a device that's used to measure a transistor's beta. So if you don't have access to a curve tracer, just use the center point of the range from the data sheet. So saturation is the state of a BJT when the collector current has reached its maximum. So what does this mean? It means that any further increase in base current, the collector current's already max. It can't go up anymore. So basically, beta has lost control. At this point, the transistor acts like a short, VCE, and VCE is approximately zero volts. On the other side, cutoff is the point at which the transistor is acting like an open. So there's no current. IC is zero. So any decrease in IB, IC is already zero. So it's in cutoff. The uh, transistor is acting like an open. And VCE will be equal to VCC. Now the active region is between saturation and cutoff. And that's where we want to operate if we're building an amplifier. We want to operate in that active region. Here's the standard format for a voltage divider bias transistor circuit. We've got R1, R2, RC, the transistor, and RE, with the base of the transistor connected between R1 and R2. In order to optimize this circuit, we need VRC to equal 45% of VCC, VCE to equal 45% of VCC, and VRE to equal 10% of VCC. So let's add, add a voltage here. Uh, let's pick a VCC of 10 volts. If we give VCC as 10 volts, that makes VRC 4.5 volts, VCE 4.5 volts, and VRE 1 volt. So for a common emitter amplifier, Z out is equal to RC. Now we don't know RC yet. We only know VRC. 
which is 4.5 volts. Um, in order to be impedance match, we want our load to match our Z out. So in this case, if we know what our load is going to be, our RL, if we know that it's 1K, we now know that we want our RC to be equal to 1K. So now that we've got RC at 1K ohm, we can determine the collector current. We know that VRC is equal to 4.5 volts with an RC of 1K. Now we can use Ohm's law, voltage divided by resistance gives us current which leaves us with a 4.5 milliamps for IC collector current. Now let's determine the beta for the transistor. So there's a couple different ways you can do this. You can simply go to the data sheet for the transistor that you have. We use a lot of 2N3904s here and you can find the beta range and just pick the middle point. For my students, I expect them to use our curve tracer with the data points of collector current set at 4.5 milliamps and VCE 4.5 volts. And that'll get you a really accurate beta for that specific transistor. If you don't have a curve tracer, then just use the uh, data sheet. So let's use a beta of 100 for this example. And with beta known, now we can calculate IB. If beta is equal to IC over IB, we can do some algebra there and figure that IB is equal to IC divided by beta. So that gives us 4.5 milliamps divided by 100. That makes IB equal to 45 microamps. Now with IB, we can calculate IE, the current in the emitter. So we know Kirchhoff says that all current flowing into and out of a node has to algebraically add up to zero. So we know that IB and IC added together must be IE, or current in the emitter. We also know that beta is equal to IC over IB, and we can do a little bit of algebra there and come up with the formula of IE is equal to IB times beta plus 1. So we should be able to do this both ways and come up with the same IE. So in our example we've got IE is equal to IB plus IC, so that's 45 microamps plus 4.5 milliamps equals 4.545 milliamps. And if we do 45 microamps times beta plus 1, 101, we, get, we also get the 4.545 milliamps for IE. Now that we have IE, we have VRE from before. Using Ohm's law, voltage divided by current, we can calculate the resistance, the emitter resistor resistance. So in our example, we have 1 volt divided by 4.545 milliamps. That gives us 220 ohms which happens to be a standard value in this case. Um, if you calculate and it's not a standard value, you need to kind of maybe mix and match some resistors to come up with as close as you can to your calculated value. So now let's take a look at R2. In order to calculate R2, we want to make sure that the current flowing through R2 is at least 10 times the current of IB. And what this is going to do is keep that voltage really stable. So if there's small changes in IB, um, it won't affect the voltage across VR2. So now we, want, we need to know the voltage VR2. And if we kirch off, we can see that we've got VBE plus VRE. So that gives us the 1.7 volts. If we divide that by the 450 microamps, which is IB times 10, it gives us 3.777 K ohms, which is not a standard value. So what we're going to do now is we're going to round that down to the next standard value, which gives us, for our example, 3.3 K ohms. Now I can take that, divide it into the 1.7 volts, and that gives us our actual IR2 of 515.152 microamps. 
Okay, now R1. This is really just an exercise of Kirchhoff's current laws and Kirchhoff's voltage laws. So we can Kirchhoff this and find that VR1 is equal to VCC minus VR2. It gives us 10 volts minus 1.7 volts, which gives us a VR1 of 8.3 volts. Now Kirchhoff's current law, that gives us an IB plus an IR2 for equal to IR1. So that, that for IR1, we've got 45 microamps plus 515.152 microamps. So for IR1, we've got total current of 560.152 microamps. Now using Ohm's law, we can calculate R1. So VR1 divided by IR1 gives us R1. So 8.3 volts divided by 560.152 microamps gives us 14.817 K ohms. Now in this case, we need to be as exact as we can. Um, really, we don't want to do too much rounding here at all. So you might need like a 10K and a 4.7K in that slot or a 15K might work. So that might be one where you, you might want to try based on when we measure, we might want to put a 15K in there to start with and see how things kind of measure out, if it's acceptable or not. Uh, if it's not, maybe try the uh, 10K plus a 4.7K in that spot. So before we build and measure, we need to make sure that we do all of our power calculations, just to make sure that we don't exceed any specifications. Now power is calculated by multiplying voltage and current. One, to, one thing to point out here is the power for the transistor. So PQ1 is equal to VCE times IC. And the power there, we would expect that it'll match the power at RC, as long as we're optimized. If we're optimized, we have the same voltage and current in both those locations, so we should have the same power. So this is our DC load line. And here you can see that we're comparing IC, or collector current, to VCE, voltage collector to emitter. And at our two extremes, we've got IC sat and VCE cutoff. At IC sat, you can see we're at our max current, where VCE is at its minimum, zero volts. And at cutoff, we're at our max voltage, VCE, but our minimum, or zero, IC. Our Q point is where we're actually operating at. It's our VCE and IC. So we're at 4.5 volts and 4.5 milliamps. Now this basically shows the three operating regions of a transistor that we talked about in one of the earlier slides. So we've got saturation, cutoff, and the active region between those two points. And that's where we want to operate if we're designing and building an amplifier. In the future, in the next lesson, in the AC part of this lesson, um, we're going to plot an AC load line across and through the Q point. And what that's going to do is allow us to calculate our V out max for the amplifier and our V in max for the amplifier. But we're going to get to that in the next lesson. So here's the final DC circuit. It's a voltage divider by circuit. Um, to get to this point, we needed the 10 volt VCC and the RL of 1K. From those two points, we were able to calculate the entire rest of the DC circuit. I pulled the chart from the handout here, and we've got VCC, VRC, VCE, VRE1. So VRE2 is going to be used to calculate gain to help um, get the gain that we need in the next lesson. So right now just NA that and treat VRE1 as though it's VRE. We've also got VRE, VR1 and VR2. So this is a good spot to stop and build this DC bias circuit just as it is on the screen here and then go measure all these values and make sure that they're pretty close to the calculated values. If there's some kind of discrepancy 
then we've got something wrong with our either our calculations or the way that we've built the circuit. They should be pretty close to the calculated values. So in conclusion, we talked about, we did a, I did a brief introduction on BJTs. Um, I highly recommend that you pick up a book, read through, read, read a little bit on transistors, go look around on the on, online. This, this exercise is really more about an application. So, so some basic knowledge or some pre-reading would be very helpful. We talked about some key terms, some things that I really want you to pay attention to. Um, we, we went over voltage wire bias and DC biasing. And we, when you hear the word bias, I really want you to think DC. That is the DC component of the amplifier, biasing. Okay, some of the unknowns or assigned values, there, we dealt with two, uh, VCC and RL. You're going to need to get your instructor to assign those two values um, to you, or you're going to need to pick those two values. And really, this was an exercise in Kirchhoff's voltage and current laws and Ohm's law. We did a whole bunch of Kirchhoff and a whole bunch of Ohm's. And next, we did some power calculations. And there's just, there's just nothing worse than the smell of burnt resistors or transistors. Um, do your power calcs. Make sure that you are not exceeding specifications of your parts. Uh, we talked about... DC load lines and what that why they're important. They basically sh show you visually the three um, operating regions of a BJD transistor. So the three operating regions are saturation, cutoff, and active region. And we want to be if we're building an amplifier, we want to be in that active region. We will not be able to amplify if we're biased in cutoff or if we're biased in saturation. We need to be biased in the middle so that that AC has somewhere to go. And then finally, we, we developed our final circuit and I said, hey, go measure this. Build this and measure it. This is a good spot to stop and make sure we're on the right track. Because if we don't have the DC part right, nothing else matters from this point. So measure, write down your calculations, um, use that table that's in the handout and then go measure it. And if it's, if it's not within 10%, you probably have some issues. I'd really shoot for 5%, 6%, 7% is okay. 10% is probably okay. Anything beyond that, then you probably have a calculation or a build error that needs to be resolved. Okay, so we're ready. If you've got your calculations and your, and your measurements are matched up, matching up, you're ready to move on to the next section of this exercise or lesson, which would be the AC section, so part two.